Well, the microphone is working enough. Maybe you can put that button in the middle. Um, not on that screen, but. Yeah, there's a camera. Well, there we go. Oh, that's, that's a bummer. No, no, uh, you can see us now. Oh, you can see. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, so in, in our course, um, Reimagining Education, we are reading your book, Walking on Water. And uh, we are wondering, as in like an opening question, if you have maybe like looking back to it because you wrote it in 2004, um, if you would, if you, I don't know, change your mind about certain things or how you reflect on the past 15 years. Um, well, that's a great question. And um, a couple of things. One of them is that uh, if I were teaching now, I would probably not be teaching the same way I was then because I wrote it 15 years ago and I'd been teaching. So I wrote it when I was 43 or yeah, 43. And I was teaching from when I was 29 to 39 and I'm in my 50s now, and uh, late 50s, and I don't have the energy to. <laughs> I the 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 sort of crazy stuff I did in class. I think I'd be much more sedate now. Um, but the book itself, the, the the main changes, I would I would I, I wouldn't change the book <laughs> itself, but what I would do is uh, emphasize something right near the end. Um, it's just a sort of a throwaway line, but I think it's really, really important, which is I used to teach students only for one quarter. I don't know whether you use quarters or semesters there. Quarter was 10 weeks, nine weeks, something like that. And uh, if I would have taught students for two quarters, the first quarter would be about freedom and the second quarter would be about responsibility. Um, because that book really emphasizes freedom, which I think is really important. Um, but I say something toward the end about how freedom without responsibility is immaturity and responsibility without freedom is slavery. And I think you need to have both. And I really think it was, I mean, the book was appropriate and the way I taught was appropriate because I think, I don't know how it is over there, but in the United States, at least, so much of our education was uh, at the time about uh, conformity. But honestly, I think there are some trends I've seen, especially in the United States in education, where um, I I look at, and this isn't just me getting older, it is a change that um, I, I think that uh, it was, there were times when I was a kid where, in school, where the teachers were too authoritarian, and I think that there are times now, well, I'll back up. <clears throat> I have a friend, I was just talking to her two nights ago. Uh, who teaches at a university in Colorado, who, uh, and I've talked to so many teachers like this, who are afraid of their students, not physically, like the students are going to beat them up, but um, yeah. there's a, she was telling me a story about one teacher who was assigning a book by Nadine Gordimer, and he got in trouble with his students for doing so. And she gets in trouble with her students all the time She's terrified because the students report her to the authorities, the administration, all the time. And um, I don't know. Did you hear what happened at Evergreen a couple of years ago with uh, Weinstein? Yeah. yeah, he's he's a teacher. I've I've interviewed him. He's he's good. Um, 
there was this this thing at the university where uh, he taught at Evergreen, and I actually did their commencement speech 15 years ago, and that would never happen now because the school has completely changed. Anyway, uh, um, they had at Evergreen, they decided they were going to have a day where African-American students would absent themselves from campus, and that's all fine, and they did that for several years. <clears throat> And then they, a bunch of students decided that it was not sufficient for the African-American students to go on strike, but that white students and white teachers were supposed to leave, leave campus as well. And Weinstein, who taught biology, didn't want to do that. He said, I'm here to teach, and I'm going to teach. I respect your right to, to do that, but you also have to respect everybody else's right to come to class if they want to. And the students uh, took over his class and then against the wishes of his own students. And then they went and took over the student or not the student, the, uh, the school president's office and the school president completely caved. Later, there were groups of students going around campus with baseball bats looking for Weinstein to beat him and his wife up. And there was no repercussion for the students. And I just remember when I was in school, and I know I'm sounding like an old fart here, but when I was in college, there were there could be protests, but classes were actually sacrosanct. They were sacred. And if there was a protest on campus, it would be not acceptable to actually go into a classroom where other people are paying for their education. And that's something that so I think that I, I like the book. I still like the book a lot. I think it's really important. And, um, and I think times have changed such that uh, I think more than ever, we need to couple freedom and responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so, so that is something. I don't know that I would change it. I might emphasize that more than the sentence or paragraph that I wrote about it. I might do another chapter on responsibility mm. if I were going to read the book. Mm. Thank you. And that was a, a thorough answer to the first question. Um, we have a student uh, who prepared also a question. Justin, you want to maybe respond? Uh, sure. Um, I have a question about like standardized standardized tests um, and how I'm wondering um, because they're still existing and heavily enforced necessary to continue our education um, if we choose to go to college. Um, let's see. What are some ways in which you see these goals? Based upon us can still be met without teaching standard material in these classes. Um, something I wanted to talk about more was culturally relevant curriculum and how this can be applied to students from different geographical places. I don't know if that. So I was I was with you for about the first two thirds of the question, and can you tell? Can you say the last third again, just so I'm clear on it? Um. What are some ways in which you see these goals can be met without teaching standard material in classes? Um, and I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about culturally, cultural relevant curriculum in different geographical places. I think, I think that, that there's a, a, one of my problems with tests in general, I go back and forth on tests, honestly, because one of my problems with tests forever, standardized tests or regular tests, was I was always pretty good at taking them, but uh, I had a friend in college who he and I would be studying together, and when we would sort of do practice tests with each other, he would do way better than I, but then he would get really nervous on tests and completely fail them. and. Again, in practice, he'd be doing way better than I, and then I would get, you know, an 82 on the test, and he would get a 47 because he was just nervous. 
So in a lot of ways, what testing tests is the ability to take tests. And that's one part. And then another part, I wouldn't have agreed with this when I was a student, but I think about it now that I think about how. So I know this is a really dramatic example, um, but it, it, it exemplifies this better than anything else I can think of. That my mom died last November and um, literally the the day and she was she she was 86 and died of cancer and um she was uh delirious and then unconscious for several days beforehand and literally the night that she lost consciousness i thought of a bunch of questions i wished i would have asked her during her lifetime and i thought of a whole bunch of things i wish i would have said and the way that applies to tests is that regret can be a powerful motivator. And there were times that I took tests where I uh, didn't know answers to things, but then because I got it wrong on the test, I learned it because screwing up was, I mean, I don't know about you, but for the most part, the only way I learn things is by making mistakes many times. And so if, and you have to do it for me, at least it has to be with something at stake. So I can't do a fake test and then I miss answers cause I don't give a shit. But then if there is the actual pain of getting I think the worst test I ever had, I got a 12 out of 100. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I have to say, the class average for that particular test was 26. So it's not quite as bad as it sounds. Um, still hate that teacher. Anyway. <laughs> um, but but, but the, 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 the pain of getting stuff wrong is... is, is <laughs> I don't know what that was, because um, the dogs and cat are upstairs. Uh, hold on, I gotta look over the, over the edge. I mean, it's, there's there's nobody in the house. Don't worry, I'm not gonna start screaming. Oh, I messed up. See, I, <laughs> I started screaming. Please don't. Don't <laughs> be terrified. <laughs> You like the puzzle square? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a horror movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now he's not coming back. We're sitting here. It's in the middle of the night. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Middle of the night. Yeah, I was, I was wrong. There's uh, one cat up here, and the two dogs are up here, and there's one cat downstairs who is uh, 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 she's a uh. Well, you know what cats do with things on tables. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened. Anyway, um, so I, on tests themselves, I kind of go back and forth on, you know, I'm really happy. That's one of the things I really liked about uh, my method of grading in college or when I was teaching was because the students determined their own grades by how much they worked. <clears throat> I really like that a lot. But I still think there is some utility in having tests with consequences. That's what I'm trying to get at is, is consequence really helps teach things. That's one thing. And then also, I think that there are some subjects for which it is appropriate to have standardized teaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, arithmetic is, I mean, you can teach it different ways, but, um, you know, it's like, Seven times eight is is going to be fifty six, and you're going to need to learn those learn it somehow. And and I'm a big believer also. Don't know if this is going way off topic, but I'm a big believer in fundamentals. And you know, I was an athlete in college, and I just thought it was so important to have like a base. And it's the same thing with um, 
with writing that it's really important for me to know. I've always remembered Harlan Ellison's a jerk. He's a writer. He's he's dead. He's he was a jerk. He was pretty horrible. But I've never forgotten a couple of the essays he wrote. And one of them was that he had no patience for writers who didn't know how to use semicolons. Because, <laughs> because he said, as a writer, you only have a half dozen tools. You got words, space, punctuation. That's about it, really. And he said this would be like a person going to work on a construction job and not knowing how to use a hammer. So it's the same with a writer not knowing how to use a semicolon. Or, you know, in college I was, God, my handwriting's terrible, but I was taught to be a drafts, a drafts you know, I was taught drafting because, um, because that's an important skill to have if you're going to be an engineer, which I unfortunately was. And um, so I'm a big believer in fundamentals too. So that's, that's the, the sort of standardized half. And then ask me your question again, and now I'll talk to the other half. Um, it's based on, let's see. What are some ways in which you see goals met um, using culturally relevant curriculum? Well, I think that there, that's, okay, so I've already established my sort of old fogey credentials with the other stuff. And then I think here too, it's really important, and this was so important when I was teaching writing, to find what the students love and teach them through those means. And when I was thinking about the multiplication tables, I thought about um, my mom taught me <coughs> arithmetic because I love sports. And so I learned arithmetic before I went to school so I could do, figure out um, a batter's batting average or a pitcher's earned run average in American baseball. And um, I still, when I said seven times eight equals 56, I still remembered just in that moment that when I was a kid, the seven times table was easier for me than the other ones because of American football. If you score a touchdown and a point after, you get seven points. So I knew 7, 14, 21, 28, 35. I knew all those before I went to school. So you find ways. That's why I had my students. I, I didn't care what they wrote about. The important thing was that they wrote. And so I think if it's really important for teachers to try to find ways to try to know their students well enough, as long as it's a small enough class, to be able to uh, find ways that the students are interested. So if you have a student who likes playing poker, that's an obvious way to teach somebody how teach somebody math, you know, because it's very odds are very, very important for that. And there was a TV series in the United States called The Wire many years ago that was about inner city Baltimore. And there was one section where they were having these inner city kids who are not liking math at all. And but they all they did like, you know, craps or, you know, the dice games. And so he got them figuring out the odds for craps. And that was in a, movie, in a TV series, but it struck me as really true. And I think a, an intelligent, uh, no, intelligence is the wrong word, a caring and, uh, oh, that's the wrong word too, empathetic maybe, or maybe a teacher with enough time. Maybe <laughs> that's key. A teacher with enough time can try to find ways to interest individual students. And I think that could be true. One can, one can still teach arithmetic uh, using sports or, well, like, tell me, give me two or three things you're really interested in. What do you love? What do you like? <clears throat> Food and going to dance. Okay, food, I don't know much about dancing, but food, I mean, that's for a kid, a little kid, that's a pretty obvious way to uh, teach fractions, certainly, because you need to know fractions for recipes, right? And you also need to know multiplication, because there's, 
Oh, yeah, you have the metric system. That's easier. I was thinking two pints and a quart, you know, all that crap. Um, <laughs> I think, is this answering your question at all? Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of it, but it also it's really hard. I think about some of my classes in college were with, you know, there might be 250 of us in an auditorium. And at that point, the teacher has no choice but to do a standardized thing because you can't individually. You know, that's a pretty interesting thing, too. I'm just going to make this really short so we can go to another question. But I did a talk <clears throat> a week ago in Colorado, and one of the questions from the audience was, do I believe in, I think it's called the Duncan number. I don't remember Duncan. I think it is, but it might be something, it might be a different name. Um, anyway, and I didn't know what he was talking about, but then he described it a little bit. And, and of course it's something I've heard about, which is you can't have a democratic governance system with more. There's a number of, it's between about hundred and 150 that if your social group is bigger than 120, or if you're, if you're, affiliation is larger than 120 you can't have it's too big to have non-formalized means of uh conflict resolution and um and governing structures so that in your class you have what 15 people or something um you could in the absence of instructors because obviously there's some authority there. Let's leave the instructors out of it. If you were trying to have a group with only 15 people, you could resolve conflicts through informally. There's small enough numbers that you can you can deal with them. Um, you can have face-to-face -face interactions. But when you get above 120, and this has been true through all societies really, indigenous people would traditionally live in smaller groups of 100 people. 50 people, 150 people, and then occasionally they would get together in larger groups. But um, traditionally, that's the size where you can still have personal interactions and you still know everybody. I just interviewed somebody a couple of weeks ago. It was pretty cool. I don't remember the other stuff they were saying or the context in which they said this, but they said, we didn't evolve to live in cities at all. And we evolved. It's just extraordinarily strange that when you walk down the street in the city, People ignore each other, and you kind of have to because there's so goddamn many people that you can't – it would drive you crazy to nod and say hi to everybody. <laughs> but how we evolved was in smaller groups where um, you would – I mean, if there's 120 people in your group, you're going to know all of them, and that's how we evolved. And so I think, I think if you're going to have a 250-room class, it is impossible to not have it be standardized. If you're going to have 15 people, you can do whatever the hell you want and whatever works, works. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Um, you said something about, when you were talking about the grades, you said something like learning is about the consequences. I said, what I, meant, what I meant to say is that consequences are a great teacher. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, um, can you, yeah, can you elaborate on that a little? Well, uh, I currently don't have any publishers, and it's really hard for me to motivate myself to write because I write for publication. I don't write like journals. I never have, and um, there's a cliche that is deadlines are a great motivator. <laughs> that's true you know if you assign a paper and you say you can turn it in whenever you want anytime in the rest of your life <laughs> probably most people aren't going to do it or a lot of people I mean so I could pretend when I was teaching back with walking on water I could pretend that um, they were doing their own directed learning because they're writing their own papers but the thing is, they wouldn't have been writing papers if I wouldn't have been forcing them to. And I don't think that's bad. Um, I remember, I, you know, I, I wrote about this in the book that, 
excuse me, for a while, I didn't take uh, I didn't take role in class until there were just a couple of students. Most students would still show up because they liked it, I guess. But there were a few students who never showed up at all when I didn't take role. And finally, I, I wrote about this in the book. I said to one of them, so if I don't take role, you're never going to show up? And he said, yeah, you must be high to think I'd show up without being forced to. I was like, well, okay, I'm going to take role then. Um, so it's just, it's, it's simply the consequences. And they don't have to be, you know, I'm going to fail you. But consequences motivate, that's all. And this is true. This is true in all of our relationships. You know, if if there's a really good a really good new restaurant in town. I live in a tiny little town. There's not very many restaurants, but there's a new one that's really good. And a meal there is eight dollars. And whenever I give them, whenever I go in, I always give them ten bucks and tell them to keep the change. And what they've started doing is, and they keep saying, no, 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 don't give us the extra. And I keep saying, nah, it's all right. Don't worry about it. And so now what they started doing the last two times I went in there is when I get home with the food, they've given me 50% more food. <laughs> and I wasn't doing it for that. But the point is, that's a consequence. Or I could go in, or, you know, I could go into their restaurant, and I like them a lot. They're really nice people. And... uh I could go in and they could yell at me and I wouldn't go back, you know? And that's just a basic consequence. Is this is making any sense? Yes, totally. <clears throat> and I don't know that I don't know that tests are a particularly elegant way of providing a consequence. But it's simply true, honestly. You know, when I was in college, I wouldn't have done any of the home I I didn't volunteer to do extra fluid mechanics questions. I only did the ones that were assigned, you know, and if I didn't, I would flunk. And I guess they knew that. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, just. Thank you. Uh, do we have a question? Bill? I can add my question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you have to come up front. Um, hi, uh, where should I speak? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm a student from Sustainable Development, and I feel from my course, it's uh, very seldom or very rare that teacher would show us what is the ideal uh, find ultimate goal of the And do you think uh, there is an ideal uh, society? Does that conception really exist? And should we can take that as a goal for sustainable development? That is my question. Um, you don't believe in asking small questions, do you? <laughs> no, 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 I just want to think about. No, it's great. It's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Um, um, and I think <sighs> I, I mean, there are so many directions I want to go with this. One of them is that. Um, okay, there's, there's, I want to introduce you to two people. <clears throat> One of them is Ruth Benedict. Um, Ruth Benedict is an anthrop was an anthropologist who tried to figure out why some cultures were good, to use her term, and why some cultures were bad. Why some cultures are really warlike, why some cultures are really peaceful, why some cultures treat women and children poorly, why some treat them well, why some cultures have a lot of cooperation, some cultures have a lot of competition. And she studied many, many cultures, and she, she said, is it race? No. Is it house size? No. Is it wealth or poverty? No. Is it... It's not even patriarchy, which I thought was the root of all evil, but it's, it's not. It's something else. That it's that she found out that sort of Richard Dawkins type people try to believe that humans are fundamentally selfish and the entire world is fundamentally selfish. 
And then you get sort of liberal do-gooders who believe that humans are fundamentally altruistic and that everything is about society. <coughs> Excuse me. And what Ruth Benedict realized by studying all these cultures is that they're both true. And that the truth is that humans are both selfish and social. And the cultures who were good cultures had figured out how to merge those two. And the way they did it was by making it so, by socially rewarding actions that benefit the group as a whole and that disre that, that, that unreward, that have negative consequences for behavior that benefits the individual at the expense of the group. And the bad cultures would reward behavior that benefits the individual at the expense of the group and would not reward behavior that benefits the group at the expense of the individual. So a really good example could be you could have this group of people and let's say that one of you uh, brings in three pizzas and doesn't share with anybody. <laughs> it's like, well, God damn it. What the hell is wrong with them? You know, you you ostracize them somehow. And on the other hand, so this isn't a good culture. So I'll back up a little bit. That there were tr nations in the Indi American Indian nations in the Pacific Northwest that had what they called a shaming pole. That if you do something really bad, then they put a pole outside your house that says, I'm an asshole. And there were people in Africa who, I'll back up. So let's say we all live in a group, and let's say we're here in the Pacific Northwest, and I go out and I catch a bunch of salmon. <laughs> I give them to everybody. You socially reward me by praising that behavior, by going, oh my God, Derek, that is so cool. It's so great you brought us so many salmon. And I can give all those salmon away because I know tomorrow that you are going to go gather a whole bunch of huckleberries and you're going to bring those in and you're going to share those with everybody. So what you're building is social capital at um, instead of, I mean, think about this in terms of a family. <clears throat> if you have a healthy functioning family, if somebody says, Junior, could you please pass the potatoes? And Junior says, that's going to cost you $2.50. It doesn't work. I mean, that's not how a healthy functioning family works. Healthy functioning family is, I do this for you, you do this for me. We have some sort of gift economy. And so Ruth Benedict then explored this more, and she found out that basically it boils down to how a culture handles wealth. But if the wealth is handled through what she called a siphon system, whereby wealth is constantly siphoned from rich to poor, then everybody in the society is going to be fairly secure and you're not going to need to have this dog eat dog competition um on the other hand if they handle it through what she called a funnel system whereby wealth is constantly funneled from poor to rich then everybody is insecure and you have a dog eat dog don't you love that phrase um, um competitive way of living and so people are generally more insecure but everybody has to do it you can't have a cheater <coughs> excuse me I picked up a cold when I was in Colorado. Anyway, um, you can't have a cheater because it only works for me to catch all these salmon and give them away if tomorrow you're going to feed me. It doesn't work if I feed all of you and then tomorrow you catch a bunch of salmon or do whatever and you don't give any back to me. That doesn't work. It's like I could go give all my money to a homeless person, but in this capitalist system, that won't work because I still have to pay my rent. You see what I'm trying to get at with this? So if there's an ideal society, it would be one that socially rewards behavior that benefits the society as a whole and does not benefit the accumulation of wealth at the expense of others. But again, everybody has to do it because if you have a cheater, the whole thing falls apart. Unless, as many cultures would do, if you have a cheater, you kick them out. Um, okay, so that's one person I want to introduce you to, Ruth Benedict. The other person I want to introduce you to is Lewis Mumford. Do you know Lewis Mumford at all? Anybody? Okay. okay, Lewis Mumford wrote a great couple of books. I wrote a, a bunch of books that were great. Lewis Mumford's really interesting. 
he was very strongly pro-technology in the 1920s and 30s, and then World War II convinced him that he was wrong. And he's really interesting in terms of being a public intellectual who publicly changed his mind and basically disavowed everything he'd said earlier. And he was, I think, one of the world's foremost philosophers of technology. And one of the things he said is that technologies don't emerge in a vacuum. And don't worry, this is going to come back to society in a minute. Anyway, technologies don't emerge in a vacuum. And certain, like... The Indians who lived here did not invent refrigerators. And it's not because they were too stupid to invent refrigerators. It's because their social system and living here with all the salmon, there's no reason to invent refrigerators because salmon stay freshest in the river. And there's always a lot of salmon. And, um, and you can smoke them. And there was, there was no need for refrigeration, so it never came up. And... He called the, the social system that surrounds a technology that gives rise to it and emerges from it, he called that a technic, T-E-C-H-N-I-C. And, and see, if you're going to be tested in five minutes on what that word means, God, everybody get it. Anyway, um, back to the other. Um, Except I wouldn't get it until I'd tested and failed three times, then I'd remember it. Anyway, um, a technic is the social system that surrounds a technology. And then he wrote this great essay, which I really recommend you read. It's only like 10 pages. He wrote this back in the 60s. It's called either Democratic and Authoritarian Technics or Authoritarian and Democratic Technics. One of those two. I don't remember which. And it's available online for free. Um, Anyway, in there, he talked about how certain technologies emerge from and give rise to authoritarian social systems. <clears throat> and others emerge from and give rise to democratic social systems. And a couple examples might make that clear. Pottery or basket weaving would be a democratic technic because no one can control your access to reeds to make baskets. That's not to say there aren't skill, there's not skill involved in making a basket. There can certainly be a lot of skill, but no one can control your access. Or a bow and arrow is a democratic technique because anybody can make one. And one I make might stink, but I can still make one. On the other hand, a gun is an authoritarian technique the point being that you can kill with both of them. That's not the point. A gun is an authoritarian technic because it requires metal and it requires gunpowder. And if you, if I have a gun and you control my access to bullets and gunpowder, I no longer have a gun. I've got a club. And so because you can control it, let's back up a second. Metal. Metals are inherently an authoritarian technic because mining is one of the first forms of slavery and it's one of the worst one of the worst ways a person can live is in a mine and so if you have metals that means you have to have a mine which means you have to have a military to steal the land for the mine you have to have a police force to get people to go in the mine. You have to have a police force to uh, protect the mined, mined ores. And you have to have a police force to protect it every step of the way. And a woven fishing net is democratic because if you steal mine, I can make another one. And if nobody can control my access to it, I'll, I'll do another example. It might help make this a little more clear <clears throat> that several years ago, I got interviewed by a dedicated Marxist who swore that it's possible to have an industrial economy with purely voluntary exchanges, no, uh, no coercion whatsoever. I said, okay, great. 
do you live in cities? He said, yeah, we got cities. I said, okay, how do you get around in cities? He said, we take buses. I said, great, what are the buses made of? He said, metal. I said, great, where do you get the metal? He said, from mines. I said, great, so how do you get people to work in mines? And then I told him all the stuff I just said a minute ago. He said, you just pay them a lot. I said, well, okay, I'll give you that one. But every hard rock mine in the world pollutes rivers. So what do you do about the people who live next to the river? He says, you pay them to move. I said, great. What happens if they don't want to move? He said, you pay them more. I said, great. What happens if they've lived there for 5,000 years, their ancestors are buried there, and they refuse to move? He said, you pay them a lot. And I said, no, they're not going to move. They're not going to leave their ancestors. He said, well, how many of them are there? I said, what difference does that make? Let's say 500. He said, well, a million people in the city vote, and that means that the 500 people out in the country have to move away from the river. I said, I see what you've done is you have moved with, in less than a minute, you have moved from, from purely voluntary exchanges to democratic empire, land theft from indigenous people, and genocide. Also, you can have a bus. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that if we're going to have a way of life that's based on mining and that's based on industrialism, it will bring with it necessarily certain social forms. Oh, and there's another part of, of Mumford's thing too that is just brilliant, brilliant. So he says that these, these authoritarian techniques are authoritarian not only because they require authoritarian social systems, but also because the technologies themselves become authoritarian, by which he means they end up in charge. And if you think this is really silly, think about it. Are cities designed more for human beings or for cars? So right now, global warming is threatening to kill the planet. And are we stopping the oil economy? Are we stopping the industrial economy? No. Who's in charge? It's like the technology is actually running the show at this point. And I mean, I thank Mumford for that. And also, I don't know, I'm just going to throw this in that Mumford said late in his life that he wished his epitaph, he wished that the, that the thing on his tombstone would read, uh, this is the most foolish man who ever lived and all his predictions were wrong. But it's not what happened. Um, anyway, so the ideal society... There is no such thing as a perfect society because, because perfection doesn't exist. <clears throat> what there is, what I know, is that the Talawa Indians lived where I live now for at least 12,500 years, and they didn't destroy the place. They were living here fundamentally sustainably. And it's amazing because the population of this county was about half of what it is now. There were a lot of people living here. And does that mean they were perfect? No, they weren't. They weren't ideal, but they lived here sustainably. And so when I think about sustainability, okay, I'm going to go one more direction with this, which is years ago, I was riding around with a friend of mine with whom I wrote a couple of books, George Raffin. It's back in the 90s. We were stuck in traffic, and I'm just making conversation. I said, George, if you could live at any level of technology that you wanted, what would it be? And George was always really crabby. And George said back to me, Derek, that's a really stupid question because we can fantasize whatever we want, but the truth is there's only one level of technology that's ever been sustainable, and that's the Stone Age. And we will be living there again someday. The only question is what's left of the planet when we get there. And so ideal society... I mean, there have been, that's another thing, is we can't talk about an ideal society, <clears throat> excuse me, because every society has to evolve in place and has to evolve in response to place. So a society based on salmon is going to be really different than a society based in a desert that's based on entirely different life ways. That's one problem I have, by the way, with Christianity, Judaism, Islam all the Abrahamic religions, 
is that Buddhism, for that matter, is that yeah, there are certain uh, generalities that can be made, but the purpose of a religion, I think there are two purposes of a religion. One of them is to teach us how to live with each other, and the other, and, and which with each other, which includes the salmon, which includes the land. It's to teach us how to live. And the other purpose of a religion is to teach us how to um, experience the divine. And I think that a religion that's based in the Near East is not going to be very useful to teaching me how to live in the Pacific Northwest because the divine is different in every place. The divine is in the place. And, and we're going to live differently in every place. So what I think, the ideal society... Presuming human, humans survive through this mess that we're in, the ideal society will actually be what it was meant a long, long time ago, which is 10,000 different societies, each one emerging from its own land base, um, based upon the needs of that land base. And the land has to be primary to everything, because without a land base, you don't have any social structure whatsoever. Thank you. I think that that's field. Wrap it up. Um, oh, and, and can we have one last question, maybe? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we the room is booked now in like a couple of minutes, so but maybe we can have a short question. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't know if it's a short question, but <laughs> but I mean, uh, you've written so many books, uh, and uh, I've read quite a few of them, but but it's also the sense of you describe things in the culture make believe in other books about the future. It feels like a lot of those things have come true. So, what is basically your your kind of outlook on the world we're in now, uh, and also maybe the place of education and writing in all of this? Is there any hope for education and writing to bring down civilization, or is this? Yeah. Well, my outlook is pretty much we're fucked, and mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't alter the fact that life is still really good, you know. And life is worth fighting for. It's real. I want to be really clear that when I say things are really bad, I'm going to keep fighting so long as there is a single blade of grass that still exists, so long as there's a single wild fungi, so long as there's a single wild salmon, so long as there's a single wild bear. Um, oh, too bad we're not downstairs. I could show you. I could show you on my porch. There's bear poop all over the porch. I see bears every day. Um, anyway. Um, And I think the role of education is really, really important. I think before we can, my job as a writer, and I don't remember if I said this in that book or a different book, my job as a writer is to articulate the things that I know in my heart to be true and to which I've not yet put words. And in so doing, I hope that that will help other people to articulate things that they know in their hearts to be true and to which they've not yet put words. And in so doing, like I still remember when I was 26 or something, I was in a library and this book jumped off the shelf at me. It was Neil Everenden's The Natural Alien. And I opened it, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was the first book I ever saw that questioned the notion that this world was made for human beings. And I can still remember 20, oh God, 33 years later, 32 years later, I can still remember the relief I felt when I thought, oh my God, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. It's the culture that's crazy. And he had this bit in there that he cited about how, what do you do? I love this. I still remember standing in the library seeing this. What do you do? If you make some impassioned defense of some creature, and when you're done with it, the person you're saying it to says, well, that's all fine, but what good is that creature? He said, the only answer you can give, really, is, well, what good are you? And that's not to insult the other person, but to show the craziness of the utilitarian perspective like that, that we all have a right to exist. Oh, I got to tell you the story. I know we got to quit, but I got to tell you the story. I was doing a, talk, a, a Skype like this with Yale. And 
they were all insisting that the most important thing that environmentalists can do is to put a value on all of nature. You know, you've heard about that, where they try to monetize everything and say, you have ecosystem services are worth X million dollars for a forest, and that's why you don't cut it down. And I kept saying, no, 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 that's just all putting it into the economic system. And how can we value it? And they kept disagreeing. And finally, I said, you know what? I just realized you're right. And in fact, I said this to one of the one of the students who was really pushing it. I said, in fact, it's so it's true with human beings too. And he said, yeah, it is. That's how that's how uh, insurance companies work. You know, if you lose a leg, that's worth X amount of dollars. Or you lose your life, you know, that's worth X amount of dollars to your relatives. I said, I know it's perfect. This is the way to make things work. And in fact, I just struck a deal with your parents. And here's the thing: is you're at Yale, which means your future earnings are probably about four million dollars. So they have a current value of about a million bucks. He said, "Yeah, as long as we're throwing out numbers, that's okay." I said, "Here's the thing: the bad news is, well, I mean, the good news is, well, no, the bad news is, I'm going to kill you. The good news is, I way overpaid. I told your parents I'd give them five million bucks for you, and they did the math on the back of an envelope. They said that sounds like a great deal. I didn't get it." Um, and the point is that I don't know what the hell the point is. Um, <laughs> the point is that you know we live in a time. George Orwell's 1984 was was just a great book, and you know we live in a time where we're told war is peace and ignorance is strength and all that. And I can't tell you how important. It has been to my life and my sanity to have people in my life with whom I can cry about extinction and with whom I can say, hey, the stock market went down 500 points today. That is great. And not have them freak out. And it is so important for me to have read people like Terry Tempest Williams or Ed Abbey or Thomas Berry or all these Lewis Mumford, Ruth Benedict, all these people who who have helped me navigate through this gaslighting that this culture does to us. And so, yes, I think your role as educators is incredibly important. <clears throat> and what I really, I've had a few people, this makes me really happy. I've had a few young people, I mean younger than I am, who have read my books and then they have written books that um, take what I say and take it further. And that makes me so happy. It's like we're all holding hands, you know, or another way to switch metaphors right in the middle. I'm standing on the shoulders of Lewis Mumford and there are new writers coming along who are standing on my shoulders. And that makes me so happy. And you have a sacred task as educators, as you know from the book, to lead forth and draw out your students. And I think that's an incredibly important role, especially as discourse shuts down and becomes crazier and crazier by the day. Um, we need, just like we need to protect every wild place as a I have a good friend who's an environmentalist who the reason he does the work, he says all the time, I'll say, I'll say this and quit. Um, the reason he does the work is because as things become increasingly chaotic, he wants to make sure that some doors remain open, by which he means if bull trout are still here in 20 years, they may still be here in 100. If redwood trees are still here in 20 years, they may still be in 100. But if they're gone now, they're gone forever. And it's the same with sanity and the same with discourse that anything you can do to protect pockets of sanity, as things become increasingly chaotic, make sure those doors stay open. Thank you, Derry. Thank you so much. Like, I think it was a super nice wrap up what you just said. And I wish we could talk longer. Um, I feel like we need to follow up. It was just really amazing to talk to you. Yeah. I hope that everyone here in the room is also satisfied. Mm -hmm. And whenever you come to Sweden, Please stop by. <laughs> do that. And I'm happy to do this again uh, whenever you want. Thank you. Uh, but we really have to, to, yeah. to wrap it up. But, but thanks, and uh, we'll speak again.
Sounds great. <laughs> okay. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.